Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how, now uh, we know how to approach anterior uveitis, intermediate uh, uveitis, posterior uveitis, and of course scleritis. Now we'll move on to how we approach a patient with pan uveitis. I have no financial interest. Pan uveitis has been classically defined by International Uveitis Study Group in 1987 as generalized inflammation of all three parts of uvea. In 2005, Sun Working Group redefined it as subset of uveitis where there is no predominant site of inflammation, but inflammation is observed in the anterior chamber, vitreous and retina or choroid. These are the symptoms which the patient with pan uveitis can come with. It can be a combination of any of these three, anterior, intermediate or posterior uveitis. But we need to ask the patient whether it is unilateral or bilateral, whether there was any history of trauma before, is the disease recurrent or you go through the notes of the previously, uh, previous physician or ophthalmologist whether there was any associated choroiditis. Why? We will come to know later. If the patient has penetrating trauma or intraocular surgery before the diagnosis goes in favor of sympathetic ophthalmia. If he, if the patient has headache, meningismus, hearing loss, alopecia, vitiligo or poliosis, diagnosis goes in favor of walked Koyanagi-Hara disease. If the patient has erythema nodosum, lymphadenopathy, respiratory problem, we need to think about sarcoidosis. If patient has recurrent oral and genital ulcers, it's very obvious that we should think about Bechet's disease. Now coming to the differential diagnosis of panuveitis. If the panuveitis is associated with exudative retinal detachment, think of Vought-Koyanagi Harada disease and sympathetic ophthalmia and few other uh, conditions which we will discuss in that particular section. If the panuveitis is associated with hypopion, think of Bechet's disease and HLA B27 uveitis. If it is associated with retinitis and vasculitis, think of acute retinal necrosis which has already been dealt with and of course Bechet's also. And if it is only associated with vasculitis, think of tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. But do remember, we need to rule out conditions which mimic inflammatory panuveitis which can be site threatening and life threatening like endogenous endophthalmitis and intraocular lymphoma. Now we'll move on to panuveitis which can present with exudative retinal detachment. I will show you few case scenarios. This was my first patient who was a 23 year old male who complained of sudden decreased vision in both the eyes with associated redness, pain and headache. His vision was 6, 12 and 10 in uh, left eye. Fundus fluorescent angiography showed typical pinhead uh, leaks in the early and intermediate stage of FFA which were the uh, progress to uh, subretinal pooling of the dye in the later stages and ultrasound was done in this patient which showed re uh, retinal detachment along with increased choroidal thickness which is very classical of walked koyanagi harada disease. This is another 24 year old girl who uh, complained of decreased vision from last two months. She was treated outside and she presented with counting finger close to face N36 in both the eyes and uh, there was severe vitreous uh, haze. I mean uh, she had a very, um, bilateral granulomatous panuveitis. Fundus picture was visible this much alone and the uh, few frames of early angiography we could see like there are uh, pinhead leaks which I showed in the last case also and disc staining. I'm sorry I couldn't get the late uh, frames of the angiogram because of the hazy view and she received IVMP immu uh, followed by uh, immunosuppressants and oral steroids in the tapering doses and she was under follow up and after 4 months of treatment her vision improved to 6 by 7.5 and 6 and her picture was something like this where you can see the depigmenting fundus and uh, sunset glow you can see now she has gone into the chronic or conventional in phase of VKH. This is case 3, a 60 year old lady who uh, presented with decreased vision in both the eye and this was the picture, fundus picture showing uh, pockets of subretinal fluid in both the eye with uh, mild disc hyperemia and uh, FFA was classical again as I showed in other cases, ugly pinhead leaks followed by late pooling of the dye in the subretinal space, classical of VKH and her ultrasound showed shifting fluid both in sit, uh, shifting fluid is checked once your uh, patient is lying down and then sitting and ultrasound showed the shifting fluid and she had a choroidal thickness, peripapillary choroidal thickness of 2 millimeter, confirming the diagnosis of VKH. 
So this is case four. This is something different. This is, was a 40-year-old male who had a retinal detachment surgery in his left eye 10 years before, and his eye looked something like this, and he complained of blurred vision in his right eye, um, and vision was 6, 9, and 8. When uh, we did the angiography, we could again see the similar picture, though early pinhead leaks are not that much classical, but there is late pooling of the dye in the subretinal space, and uh, his vision improved to 6, 6, and 6 after 3 days of IVMP, followed by tapering doses of immunosuppressives and oral steroids, and this is a classical case of sympathetic ophthalmia. This is no way related to our uh, particular talk, what we are having now, but we need to keep this in mind, this was a 22-year-old lady who presented with unilateral blurred vision in right eye and vision was 6, 12 and 6. She complained of pain on ocular movements and you can see the choroidal folds adjacent to the lesion. Her angiography showed again early pinhead leaks with la late pooling, though not that much as you see in uh, VKH. But uh, when we did the ultrasound in the orbital mode, you can see there is widening of the subtenon space and when this is seen uh, surrounding the optic nerve head, it gives the classical T-sign appearance which is confirmative of posterior scleritis. The last case in this series, again not related to this but very very important, why we will come to know. This was a 42 year old male who complained of shadow in his left eye. Vision was 624 N6 unaided but with hypermetropic correction vision was improving to 65 N6 and he was a known hypertensive on treatment and this was the fundus picture. You can see the big subretinal fluid in the left eye. Angiography was something like this. So any guesses? So there was typical smokestack and ink plot appearance and the diagnosis was multi-leak CSR. Why is it important? Why am I telling about this here? The reason is you can see this was our first patient's uh, fundus picture of the left eye and the last now what I told you the multi-leak CSR. Fundus looks like this. How does it vary? I mean how does VKH vary from multi-leak CSR? VKH leaks are innumerable compared to the CSR. CSR has a typical that smokestack or ink plot appearance and late pooling of the dye is very extensive in VKH along with disc staining whereas in multi-leak CSR that pooling is not as much as we see in VKH and there is no late disc staining. This we need to understand and differentiate when a patient presents with this clinical picture to us in ophthalmic emergency because the treatment is different and opposite. If you give steroids in a patient with CSR it will increase and steroids sees the treatment of choice in case of VKH. So in brief, VKH is a multi-system disorder characterized by bilateral granulomatous panuveitis with exudative retinal detachment associated with various systemic manifestations. It is also called uveomeningeal syndrome. History says it was first uh, described by Arabian physician and later by Wacht, Koenagi and Harada. In 1978, American Uveitis Society proposed a diagnostic criteria for VKH based on the clinical manifestations. FFA and ultrasound findings were not included in this. Followed by, in 1999, first international workshop on revised diagnostic criteria for VKH was proposed, which classified VKH as complete, incomplete, and probable. This is the... Uh, details and we call it as complete VKH when criteria 1 to 5 are met. We call it as incomplete VKH when criteria 1 to 3 are met with either 4 or 5 and probable VKH is an isolated ocular disease with criteria 1 to 3 which must be met. So clinical stages, patient presence uh, to a physician may not be as complaints of uh, headache, meningismus, all these things, prodromal stage or meningoencephalitic stage. They do present to us in acute uveitic stage or ophthalmoditory stage which I had already discussed with you. These are the photographs. The next phase is chronic or convalescent uh, stage where patient uh, has depigmentation of the fundus with the uh, sunset uh, hue and Dalen fuchs nodules uh, do develop and systemically we can see alopecia and vitil vitiligo de development in these patients. And the last stage is recurrent stage where patient presents with free recurrent uh, anterior uveitis and some unfortunate patients do develop subretinal fibrosis and choroidal neovascular membrane which may bring down their vision. ICGA in VKH, Herbert et al. have done a wonderful work which has been published in ophthalmology. Do uh, read about it. And coming to the treatment, 
IVMP is the treatment of choice in the acute phase, 1 gram for 3 days, followed by tapering doses of systemic steroids and azathioprine for 3 to 6 months, when definitely the patient improves if at all he or she doesn't develop any complications. This should be uh, followed with uh, frequent checkups, gradual tapering of the medication and monitoring the side effects. Complications, as I told you already, subretinal fibrosis, uh, choroidal neovascular membrane, complicated cataract, neovascularization of disc or elsewhere can be seen. Moving on to sympathetic ophthalmia, it's a granulomatous panuveitis. Clinical features are similar to VKH, but the patient will have a history of surgery or penetrating trauma in one eye which has elicited the sympathizing reaction in the other eye. The most dangerous time is 4 to 8 week and triple agent immunosuppression is very helpful in these patients. We need to keep them on long time for immunosuppression. Moving on to panuveitis where it can present with hypopion, the classical thing which we need to discuss is Bechet's disease which presents as recurrent painless white hypopion, severe vitritis, occlusive arteritis or phlebitis or both and retinitis and most of the patients do test positive for HLA-B51. We need to look for aphthous and genital ulcers, skin lesions and need to ask for history of recurrent ulcers which is very important. A diagnostic criteria for Bechet's was uh, proposed in 1987 by research committee of Japan which categorized it as complete, incomplete and, or, and possible and another diagnostic criteria by international study group which has my major criteria recurrent after ulcers and minor criteria recurrent genital ulcerations, ocular inflammation, skin lesions and positive pathology test. Diagnosis is confirmed if one major criteria and at least two minor criteria are seen. The next is HLA B27 associated uveitis which is seen in young patients who present with sudden painful red eye and on examination you can find either fibrinous or hypopion uveitis and they do present most of the times as anterior uveitis but some may present with panuveitis also. Most of them do check positive for HLA B27 and uh, they do very well with topical and oral steroids. Methotrexate for ankylosing spondylitis part of it will be required in consultation with rheumatologist. We will move on to panuveitis with retinitis and vasculitis. This has already been dealt with Dr. Amala George, acute retinal necrosis, which is a potentially blinding disorder, mostly unilateral, bilateral also seen, caused by herpes group of viruses. American Uveitis Society proposed a diagnostic criteria in 1994. Usually patient presents with acute unilateral panuveitis with large keratic precipitates and raised IOP. When we see this picture, when a patient presents with panuveitis unilateral and this kind of picture keep ARN in the back of your mind then look for vitreous cells severe vitreous cells which will not allow to uh, which will not allow us to see the peripheral retina very well but we need to see we may have this uh, these findings also disc edema or sometimes patient may develop with retinal detachment and dilated fundus examination looking for peripheral necrotizing retinitis with vasculitis will lead to the diagnosis of acute retinal necrosis. Treatment, clinical diagnosis of ARN is made. We need to remember that it's an ophthalmic emergency. ACTAP for PCR of viruses is required to know the etiology. Start them on intravenous acyclovir 1500 milligram per meter square per day IV divided in three doses for 7 to 10 days followed by oral steroids 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg body weight should be started three days after acyclovir uh, treatment to take care of the inflammation part. And once the vitreous haze clears we are able to see the retina. We need to do a barrage laser to prevent the future retinal detachment. It's only a try, but many patients do develop. And followed by oral val acyclovir and uh, fam acyclovir or oral fam acyclovir continued for six weeks to three months depending on the resolution. Most of the patients do develop retinal detachment. They may require vitrectomy, endolaser, silicone oil tamponade. These are the pictures pre-treatment after seven days and after four weeks. And last is panuveitis with vasculitis, tuberculosis with varied manifestations, sarcoidosis which I will be discussing in the next talk and other panuveitic entities lens induced uveitis which we need to keep in mind and lymphoma 
uh, you can see um, valence matter engulfed macrophages. Endogenous end of calmitis is one of the differential diagnosis and of course intraocular lymphoma in an elderly patient who presents with uh, masquerade and not responding to treatment. Last few slides, panuveitis evaluation and management. Once we have made the diagnosis, we need ancillary tests like uh, fundus fluorescein angiography, ICG, ultrasound, UBM and OCT and ocular tap in cases of acute retinal necrosis, endogenous end of thalmitis and lens induced uveitis. The, our diagnosis will be supported by few other uh, blood investigations, HLA typing and of course lumbar puncture in VKH which shows pleocytosis which we do not do regularly. Aims of treatment will be to achieve a successful outcome in terms of questions of inflammation in both anterior as well as posterior segments, prevent recurrences of inflammation, minimal or no side effects of chronic treatment which these patients receive, favorable visual recovery in long term. Management approach, infectious panuveitis, give a full course of anti-infective therapy followed by systemic steroids and it is better to avoid immunosuppressives. Non-infectious panuveitis, acute phase, all of them do require intravenous methylprednisone for vision-threatening lesions followed by tapering doses of steroids and immunosuppressives. In chronic phase, maintenance dose of immunosuppressives and oral steroids should be given. Do remember, do not use any drug empirically. Rule out infective pathology first. Monitor the side effects regularly because all these medications have lots of side effects which hamper the quality of life of the patient. Periodic follow-up with investigations is very important along with physician review. These are my references. Thank you.